for those who don't know me, I'm Tibia Schwartz Getzig. I am the um, director of JFN West, and I'm excited to be joining you for Chronicling COVID, um, for the Chronicling COVID session today. And um, I'm just going to start by, uh, I, everybody's going to self-introduce. So I'm going to start by turning it over to um, Aaron Dorfman, who is going to lead us off. Great. Thanks, Tibia. Um, good morning, afternoon, and evening. Uh, and thank you all for joining us for this timely session on chronicling the COVID-19 pandemic in the Jewish community. I'm Aaron Dorfman, president of Lippmann Cantor Foundation for Living Torah, one of the funders of the initiative we're going to share with you. We're going to cover a lot of ground over the next hour. First, you'll hear briefly from two of the funders involved in launching this effort. Then Melissa Averbaum of the Council of American Jewish Museums will give a brief overview of project implementation and demo and oral history pro interview. Next, we'll ask you to put on your oral historian hats to interview and be interviewed by other JFN conference participants about your experiences over this past year. And finally, there'll be an opportunity to reflect together. It was a year ago today that we got the emails telling us that our kids' schools were closing. And we entered the Meitzarim, the narrow places. Historically, crises have been crucibles in which much of Jewish life and Jewish tradition has been forged. Hanukkah, Purim, Pesach are all profound encapsulations of the Jewish community's response to historical calamity. The flourishing of reform and Orthodox Judaism were both reactions to the upending experiences of the Enlightenment and Emancipation. We're still coming to terms with the radical theological and philosophical implications of the Shoah. And even the Talmud itself can be conceived of as a colossal centuries in the making reckoning with the destruction of the temple. As a foundation dedicated to supporting the vibrancy and relevance of the Jewish wisdom tradition, we at Lippmann Kantor Foundation for Living Torah recognized early on how essential it would be for the Jewish community to chronicle our experiences of and responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. As the great historian Yosef Yerushalmi teaches us, we are a people for whom history rises to the level of sacred literature. And in the context of the racial justice uprisings of last summer, we also recognized how important it would be for that chronicling effort to encompass the full breadth of Jewish communal experience, including especially the stories of those often marginalized in our community. And finally, we recognized in the midst of so many urgent and important community needs, how hard it would be to dedicate time, energy, and resources to this work. We've been honored to find thought and action partners, fellow funders, historians, librarians, archivists, museum professionals, and social scientists who've shared our commitment to this work. And I'm gonna turn it over now to one of them, our extraordinary colleague, Stacy Turner, Director of Learning and Evaluation at the Jim Joseph Foundation. Thank you, Aaron. That was beautiful. Um, when Aaron approached us about the idea that um, he and his team had come up with for this project, we were immediately interested because we had already recognized that at that this moment in time or what seemed like that short moment in time, which has now become a longer moment in time, um, we realized that there was going to be uh, forced creative experimentation and innovation um, that we should take advantage of and that we should um, be learning from. Uh, we knew that collecting and documenting were critical first steps to learning. So um, in addition to our two foundations, uh, the Russell Berry Foundation and Schusterman Family Philanthropies joined our effort and we're now a proud collaborative of four funding partners. Um, at the beginning of our work together this summer, um, the Lippmann Camper Foundation for Living Torah had the foresight to suggest a planning phase, which pulled together a committee of 11 experienced professionals. And as Aaron mentioned, they spanned um, the areas of expertise from being historians, archivists, librarians, social scientists, and, and museum professionals. We hired an outstanding facilitator to take us through three pretty intense design thinking planning sessions. Um, 
in the first uh, probably six weeks that first identified two challenges, two main challenges. Uh, one was that there was already a lot of collecting um, and chronicling efforts happening, um, but they were extremely decentralized and a lot of times duplicative. Um, and the second uh, main challenge was that um, the underrepresented voices in the American Jewish community were actually not being included in those efforts that were currently happening. Um, so the planning committee developed the request for proposals that we eventually ended up putting out into the field in the fall. Um, and the, those RFPs addressed both of those challenges. We ultimately funded two organizations to carry out the initiative, the, Ro the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media at George Mason University um, to launch the actual web portal, which is called Collecting, the Collecting These Times, American Jewish Experiences of the Pandemic, and the Council of American Jewish Museums to implement a collecting campaign. Both of those organizations are working very collaboratively together and they each have a significant component that is focused on diversity and inclusion. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Melissa Yeverbaum, the executive director of the Council of American Jewish Museums to talk in more detail about the whole initiative. Thanks so much, Stacy. I'm really glad to be here. Hi to everyone, those that I know and those that I don't yet know. I'm Melissa Martin Javerbaum, the Executive Director of the Council of American Jewish Museums. I'm really glad to be here today to tell you more about Chronicling These Times, American Jewish Experiences of the Pandemic. So I work with Jewish museums all around North America and my colleagues are keenly aware that we have a particular responsibility to be collecting this history as we live it. So of course, this is easier said than done um, while closures and social distancing make this particularly challenging. This project has allowed us to come together with new technologies and new partners and configurations to collect safely, inclusively, and most of all, strategically. And we'll revisit that theme back at the end of this session. I think when we all look back on this chapter of our lives, it'll be so clear that we're living through one of the most fascinating periods of American Jewish history. Um, there's been innovations in community, education, ritual, medicine, philanthropy, and social justice. And of course, a lot of this work is still in motion. It's a particularly generative chapter. And I think that we're only starting to feel the repercussions of that. So for those of us that care about Jewish arts, history, and culture, what will be the material and digital record of these times? And I think fortunately, we know a lot of the right partners to help us get this work done. And uh, in contrast to Jewish museum and archive work of the past, instead of for waiting for the collections to come to us, I think we're much more active agents in identifying and proactively seeking the voices, stories, and materials that we want to have populate the record. So the Collecting These Times project supported by the Chronicling Funder Collaborative has given us these two amazing opportunities to structure the collecting process. The George Mason University's web portal. So you'll get a link at the end of the session. The web portal shows the diversity of collecting projects around the country that touch on the American Jewish experience. It's continually updated. It shows digital born ephemera from around the country and it points you in the right direction, whether you wanna browse materials, whether you wanna to add to them, whether you wanna research and learn more um, or join the effort in some other way as a partner. At the same time, my organization, Council of American Jewish Museums, is partnering with 18 Jewish museums and organizations to record oral histories. This is some of the most exciting work that I've seen happen in the field. We often talk about partnerships, and I think that this past year has really forced us to rethink what partnership looks like. It's certainly not bounded by geographic proximity or pre-existing relationships. 
And when I look at the array of partners that are on board for this effort, it's truly astounding. The Funder Collaborative and a range of institutions, that's everything from the National Museum of American Jewish History to the Iowa Jewish Historical Society to the new Museum of the Jewish People in Israel, which also collects American materials, and to social justice organizations such as Repair the World, and health organizations like Vad Refuah, which works with Haredi hospitals and rabbis in Brooklyn to do public health care advocacy in Haredi communities. So we're really excited about the opportunity at hand. And with the tools in place, it's now up to us to create the historical record that we want to preserve. And so with that in mind, I'm now going to show you a glimpse of what the oral history work looks like. And I'm happy to have with us here today, Zach Ellis. Go ahead and wave, Zach. He is the founder and creator of the Their Story Oral History Platform. It's working with a range of Jewish organizations around America. And Zach's going to show us um, an oral history interview and take us into it in the Their Story platform. Take it away, Zach. Thank you so much, Melissa. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you, with the KGM team. Uh, really an honor to support your work and to be here today with, uh, with the group for, for today's discussion. So let me share my screen and we'll dive right into the inside look of an oral history interview. I am Zach Ellis, the founder and CEO of Their Story, interviewing Rabbi Danielle Eskow for the Council of American Jewish Museums Collecting These Times Oral History Project. Danny, thank you for making the time. No problem. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about the work you guys are doing. Absolutely. So to start things off, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So I am a conservative rabbi. I graduated from the Jewish Theological Seminary about 10 years ago. I live in Brookline, Massachusetts. I have three little kids under the age of seven, um, and I am the CEO and founder of Online Jewish Learning, which is an online program that does one-on-one -on -one and small group classes for families and institutions all over the world. So that's kind of my work life and personal life. And I also have been very involved, especially during the pandemic with the survivor community in Boston. Um, my husband's grandparents were Holocaust survivors and we are very close with them. We've named our children after them. We live in their old home that we renovated. We are very, very connected to them. And so my husband and I have been involved in multiple organizations, including Boston 3G, which is for third generation or grandchildren of survivors, as well as uh, Jew which is a Jewish Uber, uh, is an organization that delivers uh, Shabbat and holiday meals to frontline heroes and to Holocaust survivors. And so I've been doing that on a weekly basis with my two older children, and it's been an incredible experience. So this has kind of led to a project I've been working on, which is that we have set up a clinic for the COVID vaccination for Holocaust survivors. Wow, that that's incredible. So how how did your life, your work change when the pandemic hit? So just like everybody else, it completely changed. Thank God we were healthy and fortunate and able to you know, continue working. Our businesses were fine, thank God. Um, but you know, my my three kids were home. My childcare stopped coming, and my business exploded. So, in a good way. So it's been, you know, it was difficult. It was a difficult, you know, year. Um, but in terms of, you know, relationship wise and community wise, it's been very isolating to have to be home. And so that kind of got me thinking, um, along with my sister, who's a physician, about you know how can we help communities that are in need of getting this vaccination that are having a difficult time. And part of what I felt so blessed about was the fact that you know, I was in phase one in Massachusetts, being a clergy person, working with the elderly. My sister as a physician was phase one. And we were talking about how difficult it must be given that it's so hard to get appointments and it's all virtual for the elderly to do this. And so she had said to me, why don't we, you know, contact some of the organizations that you, me, Danny, are involved with, with survivors, and try to see if we can set up something for them or help drive them to appointments. 
And so I reached out to the physician who administered my vaccine, this really nice Jewish doctor um, here in Brookline. And I said, would you be open to setting up a chunk of slots for survivors and we'll, we'll handle everything. And he said, that's great. Whatever you guys want to do, you know, I have the vaccines, we'll set it up. And so we actually ended up setting up the clinic at our synagogue, Congregation Keelot Israel in Brookline. It's very accessible for all abilities. And we had um, 120 vaccinations that happened there for the first round um, at the end of February. We had medical volunteers. We had from the community, from outside the community. We had uh, volunteers from all over uh, Boston. And we had about 15 survivors in the end because of the fact that so many of them had been on wait lists and got earlier appointments. But once the governor of Massachusetts enabled us to do 65 plus, we then sent it out to children of Holocaust survivors. So it was just really beautiful because, you know, we ended up having this incredible, holy, special experience around the vaccine, which I know for so many people, myself included, it was an emotional experience to finally kind of feel like you could take a breath. Um, but for survivors to be able to do it in a way that was special for them, it was focused on them. There were people sitting around, you know, in a socially distant way, asking them questions and hearing their stories. And for them to be able to do that in a Jewish setting was really special for them. Um, and I think this was the first time for a lot of these people that they have been with others again. They've felt so isolated. They've been stuck at home. A lot of them voiced that they had you know, re a resurgence of like PTSD from being isolated during the war. You know, this was just a really incredible, holy moment for all of us who were involved. Wow. Wow. And it sounds like a big part of it was you kind know, of being able to connect and share stories with, with each other um, and build some of those relationships. When you think back to kind of all of the stories that you heard people share, I, I mean, What's like the first that pops to your mind? So I feel like there are so many um, and so many that we didn't even hear yet. And we have the second clinic next week. So I'm excited to see everybody again. But uh, one story was about a, a woman who talked about, you know, being in the forest, talked about, you know, how they survived with no food and, you know, having to be so careful and just thinking about, you know, the way that we live our lives today and the stuff that we stress out about, it really put things into perspective. Um, and it was just very powerful. And another comment, not a story, that a, a child survivor made. Um, she was very young when, when the war was over. She said, we didn't survive everything we went through to die alone of COVID. And I thought that that was just so powerful because for us, yes, our lives as young people are put on hold in a certain regard. But we're not completely isolated. We're able to do certain things. And for these people who went through so much to then live their last couple years, because, you know, that unfortunately there aren't many survivors left alone and in fear, it's just horrific, right? That's not, you don't go through what they went through to then end your life this way. Um, so we just felt really honored to be able to do a small part to hopefully give them some more freedom again. But yeah, that's, that's incredible to, to think about um, kind of how this time period has uh, brought up memories or uh, kind of just the perspective that a survivor brings to, to the pandemic. One of the things during the Collecting These Times initiative that was interesting to me uh, that the, the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education that had brought up was some of the surprise connections or reconnections that happened uh, in the Portland community when they went through their their kind of oral history project and, and, uh, and making connections that way. I'm curious, what if any surprise connections or relationships uh, have come about either for you or, or others in the community based on kind of bringing people together in this way? Right. So it's pretty amazing. Jewish geography never ceases to amaze me. It's just there's always some sort of connection. So my husband's grandfather, his name was George, and uh, his original name was Gimple. But when he came over after the war, the person who admitted him into the United States said, you know, what's your name? He said Gimple. And they said, that's not going to work here. <laughs> I choose a different name. And so he said to the person, whoever, like the customs person, etc., he said, well, what's your name? And the guy said, George. He goes, I'll be George, which is like such a typical like Holocaust survivor. Like I've been through so much. I don't care what my name is. Right. And so he became George. And 
um, during the war, uh, George saved a man named Steve Ross, who was a very active, he's since passed as well, um, survivor in the Boston community. He founded the memorial in Boston. He was a big speaker. He wrote a book. Um, and I had, I had heard of him, but I'd never met him. And I, I know, you know, I've met his son, who's an active, um, active in politics in Boston. And someone wrote us as a result of the listserv blast to the second generation named Julie. And, you know, she asked for a vaccine. She said that she is suffering, unfortunately, from cancer and is in treatment. And obviously she is eligible due to, you know, the conditions that she has. And she, um, I wrote her and I said, are you Steve Ross's daughter? And she said, yeah, how do you, how do you know him? And I said, well, my grandfather was, you know, my husband's grandfather was George Goldrich. And she said, oh my God, how does your family keep saving us? And I just got the chills and I got them again right now. It, I don't feel like I'm saving people. That's not my role. I'm not a physician. I'm not a medical professional, but the fact that she felt she was getting more of her life back in the way that my you know, husband's grandfather saved her father. It's just remarkable. And she said it multiple times. And so there was actually a forward article. There was a reporter there the whole day to talk to people. And she also got her vaccine that day because she was eligible. And what she wrote at the end of the article was that Julie said that she feels as if her dad and Gimple, she called him, or George, are up there somewhere, and that Steve is nudging George and saying, come on, my daughter needs the vaccine. Talk to your granddaughter. Um, and I just thought that was such an amazing way to end the story and to kind of like bring together this whole experience. It wasn't just about putting vaccines in arms. It was about being there for other people in our community. And that just, I feel like, is a, is a perfect example. Wow. Wow. I mean, it just strikes me that it's such, you know, amazing work that you're doing that I imagine uh, you might look back on and be just incredibly proud of, uh, of the work um, and the relationships that have been made from it. I'm curious if you, um, let's imagine a, a hundred years from now uh, and your great, great granddaughter is kind of stumbling upon the uh, this interview or, or, or this story uh, about this time. I mean, what what would you want to say to her? What what message would you want to? Well, you're you're getting her? me all emotional thinking about that. Um, you know, I said to my husband that I felt that after the first clinic, I felt that this was the most important thing I've done in my life, and I I can't. I don't know. I almost can't put into words. And I would want my great great grandchild to know about the Holocaust, to know why the survivors are so important. You know, even now people are forgetting, unfortunately. So I hope in a hundred years, stories like this help people remember and learn. Um, and I would want them to know that it's their responsibility to take care of other people. And, and that's what I seek to do with my life. So I hope my great grandchild is a mensch and does good things. <laughs> I, I have a feeling that uh, being a mensch gets passed on, uh, uh, generationally uh, and in hearing the story will certainly I think uh, uh, be an inspiration anything Thank else you. That, that you would want to share or be remiss if you if you didn't share I think really the only thing is I hope that people who hear this story of what we were able to do here in Boston um, think about ways that they can help other people in their communities, whether it be to get a COVID vaccine, to drive someone to an appointment, you know, to deliver a meal to an elderly person who isn't able to leave their home, just to do something to help those in our communities that are in need of help. And, you know, we were doing these deliveries for Shabbat meals before COVID hit, um, and we did it through and we're doing it now. And I think it's just really important for people to know that even just delivering flowers or a challah to someone, just letting people know that you care about them during this time is incredibly powerful. Um, and it's fulfilling. There's nothing that warms my heart more than seeing an elderly person feel thought of, you know, and feel that they're, that they're special. So, well, Danny, thank you so much again for taking the time for sharing your story and for all the work that, that you're doing. And thank you for telling our stories. It's very important. And this is a very important work you're doing. Thank you. I'll send Thanks it back. Thanks so much, Thanks. Zach. So that gives you an idea of a sample. And of course, that was a, just a 12-minute segment 
I think um, some of those of you who know about museum work know that oral histories are a long part of our institutional culture, especially in Holocaust organizations um, and other ways that we document the Jewish experience. But uh, technology is changing. And that's one of the things we've all been aware of before the pandemic, but especially during the pandemic. And how can we leverage those digital assets, those technological assets, and our expertise to have greater impact? And one of the things that I've realized in talking with funders and talking with colleagues over the past year is that exactly what museums are known for, the material culture, the collecting, the showing of artwork, is where we can be most nimble. I think we, we kind of got in a fortress mentality where a lot of us were frustrated with things that couldn't change overnight. Um, what is, you know, our governance, our buildings, our locations, things that are, are longer standing and, and harder baked. But the very things that museums are best at are the things where we can have so much immediate voice. Um, collecting is one of the most nimble sides of museum work. Um, bringing new voices to the table and activating them in programs and collections, commissioning artworks that respond to this moment and the Jewish experience of it. Those are all things we can do very immediately. So I'm so glad that we have found the right partners that want to take that seriously and to move that work forward. Um, with that spirit, we are now going to ask you all to practice being oral historians and interviewees, because whether you believe it yet or not, your stories are probably particularly important to the American Jewish record. You all have seen a lot happen in Jewish community over this past year, and you've experienced a lot personally. So Sivia is gonna send us into breakout groups of twos. I'm gonna post here in the chat suggested questions. Um, which are simple. You could take them in your own directions. Tell me a little bit about yourself. How has the pandemic most affected your life and work? Are there any rituals or Jewish practices that have changed or been particularly meaningful to you throughout the pandemic? So we're going to take about 10 minutes split up into pairs. Um, take a turn being both the interview and then the interviewee. Um, a note that even though this session is recorded, we're not going to share your interviews publicly in any other outlets, so you don't need to worry about what you say. And with that, um, we'll see you in the breakout rooms and back on the other side. Why don't you, Melissa, Yeah. let's do a report back and see what people experienced. Absolutely. Well, welcome back. So I think it would be fun to share um, to hear from each person something they learned about the other person that they didn't know before. So I'm just going to call on you so that way you, you can tell us what you learned. Um, Aaron, what did you learn? I, I learned that, that Lexi and I have swapped coasts. She's a former uh, Brooklynite and I'm a former Bay Area denizen and she's holding down the fort in the Bay Area and I'm, uh, I'm owning Brownstone Brooklyn. I mean, that, that's actually, that, that's overstating the case. I don't own anything in Brownstone, Brooklyn. I was <laughs> you know going to say, I mean. we should talk. <laughs> metaphorically, metaphorically. Aspirational. <laughs> Aspirational. That's great. See, what did you learn during your conversation? Okay, yeah. Well, Aaron and I, despite the fact that we did overlap in the Bay Area, we're new friends here on Zoom. So... I learned an awful lot about his life and work in this small period, but um, most impressive was just, it sounded like during the pandemic, he was able to gather a kibbutz of family members in uh, outside of New York uh, in Westchester and to bring several families together to have a more you know, communal experience during the earlier parts of COVID. That's great. Stacy, what did you learn? I was not a good interviewer. I'll just say that because <laughs> I was so interested in my conversation that I wasn't watching the time. Um, but I did learn, which I hadn't realized before, that Lou started Canvas right as the pandemic um, was starting, which I, I, I had thought it was before that. But that brings a whole lot of challenges that we um, ended up discussing in, in detail. Great. Lou, what did you learn? 
I learned how excited Stacy is to be working on this particular project and um, that, and you know, it's so consistent with how I think about uh, strategic and constructive philanthropy. And certainly you got a dose of that from Harold Grinspoon if you saw the plenary earlier. Um, but the, the idea of just working together and Stacy was saying that she hasn't had as many opportunities to work with other foundations and what a pleasure it's been to work with the team at Littman Camphor. And um, in my experience, those kinds of partnerships just always yield good things. That's great. Sivia, were you in a conversation with someone? I was not, but I'll ask you, Melissa, what did you learn about Zach? Oh, I had no idea. So I've been, you know, partnering with Zach all this time. And the first thing he tells me is that he misses wrestling. He's a wrestler, this fellow. <laughs> okay, I just have to, I'm sorry, to, Zach, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just have to tell you a 30 second story, which is that when, when um, in California, when we switched to, um, uh, boys and girls being separated in gym and we were allowed to mix uh, uh, they offered a wrestling class and none of the girls would would volunteer so I volunteered and I was, <laughs> I was in the wrestling group but the only problem was that I weighed like 90 pounds and it was really difficult to find a boy that only weighed 90 pounds so that we were even Leah anyway sorry to interrupt you well, this will be for the Jewish Wrestlers Conference, obviously. <laughs> right. right. I, 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 I was I, a high school wrestler. I just, sure. uh, oh, go, go for it, Lou. I just wanted you to know, Zach, I was a high school wrestler, I think, for one meet. And then, ah! <laughs> <laughs> that was enough for me. I didn't like being suffocated on the floor by other people. Oh, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to suffocate them. Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that just wasn't me. <laughs> Zach, what did you learn about Melissa? Uh, what did I learn about Melissa? I learned that uh, she likes to sing and had a very serendipitous uh, first haircut after the uh, deep into the pandemic where there may be an opportunity together with her hairstylist to do an outdoor uh, concert venue together to bring uh, some singing to uh, to Brooklyn. Yeah, the hair salon has a lot of outdoor space, which is why you could get your hair cut there, but it's one of the only safe places to sing together in Crown Heights is outdoors. So uh, coming, coming soon to you in Crown Heights, right near Repair the World. Could be some outdoor performance. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks for doing this exercise with us and um, also, I, I wanted to mention that this process, we did it very informally here, is um, like I said, being led by 18 partner organizations so far with us, that uh, most of them are museums, but not all of them. Several of them are Jewish organizations that um, stand for other communities, which is part of our work on inclusion. We also um, are training non-museum and non-archival organizations how to do the work of collecting. And I think that has tremendous implications. If we're teaching the Jewish community how to collect and preserve its own record, that has um, tremendous potential for us. And building those bridges and inviting new people into the museum. As I said, this is one of our most nimble areas. And we wanna think about how are we collecting and saving the work of artists and the other people that have gotten us through this pandemic because the Jewish story has been absolutely tremendous. Um, for me personally, running a national organization, I also realized that collecting as a national strategy or even a global strategy is not something we have done before. That often the museums and the repositories are cued to certain geographies or stakeholders, so they collect in their natural arenas. Um, the past year has told us that we have brand new relationships that we're not bound by geographic um, proximity anymore. So to say as a Jewish community, what is important to us to collect? Whose voices are we gonna elevate? What materials do we want to leave behind to teach future generations is a tremendously powerful 
um, an engaging way to move forward and it's no longer in the hands of a few. So I, I really want to thank all the partners that have been part of this. I see though there's a question from Lou. Did you have a question? Did I see your hand up? I did raise my hand. Are we out of time or? No, 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 no we've got time. Okay. I just wanted to ask about um, how, how the collection will be cataloged and made accessible. Um, what do you think about? And I'm also going to put a link in here um, for the Steven Spielberg Yiddish uh, Digital Yiddish Library, just because it is one project that I happen to be a part of that that did cross geographic boundaries and was more about just a whole collection of things. And I think it's worth, there are some important lessons that we learned in doing that. So I encourage you to speak with some of the folks there about, I mean, I know Melissa's in touch regularly because her board chair is the is the exec there. Um, but that, that's a really good example of it. But I'm just curious, how how will it be cataloged and how will people find it? Um, and, and from my vantage point, uh, working with the creative community, how might the creative community have access to it to reinterpret or um, make use of, of the, the collection? Yeah, so in this phase, what, um, what we are doing, we have two kind of digital frontiers. One is that the Their Story platform currently holds and preserves all of the recorded data that is the oral history data. Um, that is used as a reference library by the 18 organizations so they can learn from each other's collecting, but each recording is deed of gifted to the museum that conducted the recording. Cajun serves as a catch-all net for individuals that might not automatically align with a particular museum. So if we hear about a particular story, we instantly have several trained professional oral historians that can go and collect the story. And Cajun's archives always go to American Jewish Historical Society. So the net for preservation is there. It, the entire body of recordings exists in this reference platform, but the Roy Rosenzweig George Mason University portal, collecting these times, which I put in the chat right above Lou's post, references all of the collections. And the collections are also going to have, have different access points. But um, basically, if you're trying to find everything, go to the Roy Rosenzweig site, um, but anybody who wants access and isn't finding it at first pass between their colleagues and our colleagues, we could navigate you to the material. We're also doing metadata. Um, Susan and Yiddish Book Center is um, leading our efforts in standardizing metadata and nomenclature. So that way the search mechanism will look for Jews of color or pandemic or patient zero or whatever in a consistent manner. So we're working on that. And importantly, we have a really exciting team of advisors for this project that are working on us with our DEAI approach. So we're hiring uh, a consultant team and we've also been developing our team of advisors representing different facets of the American Jewish community. And it's a fantastic array of thought leaders who give us great access and a lot to think about for the future of museums. I also can I ask you a question, Melissa? Yeah. Um, I'm sorry if you if it, this was already um, stated, but are you how long will this project go on? The reason I'm asking is because I know at Canvas, where I get to serve as a senior advisor with Lou, um, we're talking about projects that will uh, potentially a project that will in the future kind of put artists to work to document what has happened during the pandemic, but that may not, you know, those projects may not happen for six months or a year or who knows, 18 months out. How, how far into the future will you continue to document? I think that this grant period uh, lasts for another 12 months ahead. So it's guaranteed for the next 12 months. I could say though, you know, on the record yet off the record, that many of the museums will probably continue to use the platform and will continue this type of work. It's one of those things, how will we ever go back, right? Like little tape recorders and showing up at people's homes, we'll do that as well. Um, because sometimes that equipment has different sound qualities. We also, by the way, have um, 
technology through Yiddish Book Center to record more formal histories in their studio. But I think this um, type of collecting is here to stay. And I think, you know, these 18 organizations, many of them are going to continue the work and Kajum will certainly always make the net available and cue to American Jewish Historical Society. So um, Sivi yeah. and Lou, with the, the Canvas grantees, I've been sure to let all the other partners know that their artists and creative stories are really important to this time period. And uh, you know, right now, a lot of them are working on specific pieces for Pesach with dwelling in a time of plagues, but we wanna record their stories and, and many, many others that are so generative and doing such important work in our communities at this time. Great, thank you. Yep, I posted in the chat, we're coming up on the last few minutes, um, the Cajum page on our website. And this is always our reference point on how to reach us or get involved. If you know of important stories, and I know you all do, whether it's your own stories, that of your family, stories from your communities, people doing amazing work in the community, people that have suffered losses, people that have rebound and reorganized, and um, created new things from this time. We're here to record those stories. We have really unlimited capacity at this point, thanks to the generosity of the funders and the technology of their story. You can always contact me or click on our webpage. And there is a link right there for people to fill out to record your own story. And the story of Jewish philanthropy in this time is part of our history as well. And we don't want to take for granted that that will not be tremendously interesting to the future. So let's be sure to record that as well. Um, we're going to wrap up, but I, I just want to take a moment to thank Aaron and Stacy so much for their leadership and their vision and their support throughout the whole process. They are and have continued to be tremendous partners in this work. Um, so thank you, Lipman Camper Foundation, Jim Joseph Foundation, and the other funders on the Funding Collaborative, the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Philanthropies and the Russell Berry Foundation. I really feel this is a, a real partnership um, and such an active time where we've been able to work with our funders on real problems affecting people every day. And I'm, I'm really so grateful because we're really reaching new heights together. <laughs>